Please turn with me to Genesis 35, starting at verse 1 until verse 29. Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel and settle there, and build an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you, and purify yourselves, and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress, and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had, and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Sheshem. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell upon the towns all around them, so that no one pursued them. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is, Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar, and he called the place Our Bethel, because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried under the oak below Bethel, so it was named Alon Bakuf. After Jacob returned from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, Your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him, at the place where he had talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. Then they moved on from Bethel. While they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar and to this day that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. Israel moved on again and pitched his tent beyond Migdal Eder. While Israel was living in that region, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine, Bilal, and Israel heard of it. Jacob had twelve sons, the sons of Leah, Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Rachel's maidservant Bilal, Dan and Naphtali, the sons of Leah's maidservant Zulpah, Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. Jacob came home to his father Isaac in Mamre, near Kiriath, Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed Isaac lived a hundred and eighty years. Then he breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people, old and full of years. And his sons Isu and Jacob buried him. Please turn with me to chapter 37. Just reading verse 1 and 2. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Thank you, Natasha, for the good.
negotiating all those names. Uh, it's quite a it's quite a challenge to to and who knows how you actually pronounce these names, but it doesn't matter. We we read it as they are, and uh, we want to look at the story today. And the story really is about Jacob returning to Bethel. Remember where he started uh, off fleeing from uh, Canaan, where he deceived his brother, deceived his father, and his brother was about to kill him. So he fled to his uncle Laban uh, in, in Aram, in Padan Aram, or in Aram Naraim. It's also called the Aram of the Rivers because it lies between two rivers in northern Mesopotamia. And as he was fleeing, he came to a place called Bethel, and he had that vision of a stairway reaching to heaven, and above it stood the Lord, and the Lord made a, a promise to him, the same promise that he had made to his father uh, Isaac and to his grandfather Abraham. Now, the first thing I want to do this morning is ask you, why do we look at these stories? Why does it, what does it have to do with us? Maybe you're sitting here today and you're wondering, why are we looking at all these ancient stories? Has it got anything to do with us? And uh, for many of you it will be clear why we are looking at them. But I just want to remind you that God spoke a promise. He made a promise to Abraham. To Abraham and Sarah, really. And then he repeated that same promise to to Isaac and Rebecca, and that promise was that God would bless them, that God would give them a seed, a singular seed, through whom all the nations on earth would be blessed. Every single nation on earth would be blessed. That God would give them the land, and God made many other promises such as that. And He now repeats that promise, He repeated that promise as Jacob fled from from Canaan, he slept that night at Bethel, and now he comes back to Bethel again. And he repeats that promise, and that promise comes to Jacob and Leah, because that is his first wife, and a son from his first wife will carry on the promise. And we know, the New Testament tells us that the promised seed that is promised to Abraham and to, Jacob, to Isaac and to Jacob is Christ. Galatians 3.16 The promised seed of Abraham is Christ. He is the one through whom the nations will be blessed. So what you have in the Old Testament is the story of Jesus' ancestors, his human ancestors. is the genealogical line of the Christ. That is why it's in the Bible. I mean there are thousands of other manuscripts and books that have been written over time. But these are there because it concerns the Christ. And that's why you have the genealogies in Luke, in Chronicles, and in Matthew, telling us that where the Christ came from, who was the human ancestor through Mary of the Christ. And that's why it's in the Bible. It's actually telling us the Gospel story. And that's why it's important. And we find that throughout the Bible, either the covenant uh, line, the family line of Jesus, tried to wreck this promise by their sinfulness or the idiotic decisions, or Satan wants to destroy this promise. And you see that throughout the Old Testament. But God is true to His covenant and true to His promise, and He makes sure that it will happen. And that's why it's in the Bible. I just wanted to say that to you. So the Old Testament is the story of the expectation of the coming of the Christ. And that's why these stories are there. Now returning to the text before us this morning, we see that after all the trouble that Jacob and his, his offspring caused at Shechem, they still don't get it. They're still happily living near Shechem. And then God speaks to Jacob in Genesis 35 verse 1 and this is actually the climax of this whole passage is actually in verses 1 to 3. So we start off with the, with the most important part of the text. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and I build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from 
your brother Esau. That's when he fled from Esau. He slept that first night at, at Bethel. He saw that vision of the stairway. And God said to him, Go there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you. Now, I don't know if you read that, if it sounds strange to you. God is speaking about somebody called God, who is not him. He's saying, God who appeared to you. And we wonder, what is he saying? Is, are there two gods? Is there confusion here? Because if you speak about yourself, you would say, go up to Bethel where I appeared to you. You don't say where God appeared to you. So who is that? Well, we know from that story that Jacob saw the pre-incarnate Christ. And it's in virtually every chapter of Genesis. So here we see it again. God speaking to Jacob and saying, Go to Bethel where you saw God who appeared, the pre-incarnate Son of God, where you saw the second person of the Trinity. That is really what he's saying here. And then he says, After all these things, you need to now make a move. You're still stuck here in Shechem and you need to be at Bethel because Bethel is the place where God the Son, he doesn't say it in that way but he says God appeared to you and he's speaking of another person. Now what happens next is that Jacob starts to realize he has to change his life and in verse 2 he says to his household that to all with him get rid of the foreign gods and purify, purify yourself and change your clothes then come let us go to Bethel where I build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress who answered that Jacob in the day of his distress the pre-incarnate Christ we saw at Bethel in that vision of the stairway and has been with me wherever I've gone again and again we read in the story that the angel of the Lord appeared to Jacob. The angel of the Lord tells him how he should make the goats. You can go and read that story. You can remember that. The angel of the Lord tells him to go back and so on and so on. And so Jacob did was what was commanded. And unbelievable as it may, have, may seem, and after all this time, Jacob has had all these experiences. First at Bethel. Then in Paran Aram, where God spoke to him. Then when the Lord said to him, go back. Then with his struggle at the Jabbok River, and he wrestled with the Lord. And again and again and again, Jacob had all these experiences. And now we hear that half of his family, or most of his family, are still worshipping foreign gods. You remember that Rachel stole her dad's? Household gods, they had household gods that lived in the corner of the hut or wherever they lived, tent. They had a household god and Rachel stole them. And Jacob, after the oldest time, he must have known that Rachel stole her dad's for, uh, household gods. And they had rings in their ears, painted rings that signified some foreign god. And now Jacob says to his family, Come, let us purify ourselves, let us get rid of the foreign gods and let us go to Bethel and worship the true God. So verse 3 again, like I say, this is really the climax of the whole passage. Who was this God who spoke to Jacob again? Let's read verse 3 again. Let us go to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. The God who met me at Bethel, the pre-incarnate Christ. I'm saying this again and again so that you can see this because we read over these passages and we say, people say like Jews and Muslims and other folks may say <clears throat> there is no Christ, there is no, there's no hint of, of God being more than one in the Old Testament, but it's everywhere. It's interesting that, <clears throat> excuse me, when Jacob on his deathbed later on, many, many years later, on his deathbed, he blessed Joseph and his two sons. 
And you know what he said to Joseph and his two sons? In Genesis 48, verse 15 and 16, he said, May the God before whom my fathers, Abram and Isaac, walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, so far so good, you will get that, the God before whom my fathers walked, the God who has been my shepherd to this day, verse 16, the angel who has delivered me from all harm. Who is the God before whom his fathers walked? Who is the God who has been his shepherd, who appeared to him again and again? The angel who has delivered me from all harm. Now, it doesn't mean a being with wings and feathers. It's the angel of the Lord. It's the second person of the Trinity. It's the messenger of Yahweh. And he says, this is the one who has been with me all my life. And this is the one he's referring to here in Genesis 35 verse 3. And we have to read the Old Testament again and take out a highlight of something and mark these passages and see how many times it speaks of someone called Yahweh who is not the Father. And that is Christ. That is who we see in the Old Testament. So he repeats this over and over and over again. And so Jacob now wants to change. He's been given a new name, but he's still living according to his old name. And he wants to change, and he buries these gods. And we read in verse 4 and 5, And they gave Jacob the foreign gods, and they buried them under the oak tree at Shechem. So I, I think if you can find that tree today, you might find those gods as well. Uh, some archaeologists will want to dig this up. Uh, then they set out, and the terror, then God used His covenant power, and His covenant blessing, and the terror of God fell upon the people of the land. The Canaanites realized that Jacob, God was on Jacob's side. That's what they realized. They saw, saw that this man, God would, was at work in this man's life. Now, my friends, just to ask you this morning, how about you? Maybe you're a child of God. Maybe Christ has spoken to you just like to Jacob many, many times. Maybe through your mother when you were a little child. Maybe at Sunday school. Maybe through a, a prayer. Maybe through a Bible reading. Maybe through a message. Maybe some elder or somebody at church spoke to you. Maybe a friend and said you must set your thing, life right before God. And he warned you against idols, foreign gods, worshipping your career or your sport or your body or your family or your children or whatever we do to worship uh, our money, our investments. And he is saying to us, wake up, get rid of the foreign gods. Worship the true God of the Bible. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, do not store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Hey, on earth, store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust and thieves cannot come in and steal and, and destroy here on earth, those things can be lost. Those things can be stolen. He says you cannot worship God and money. Whatever the gods are that you have in your life. Maybe the stuff you watch. The programs you see. The movies you watch. We have moved so far from what God desires in terms of purity. Sexual purity. And every program you watch on television or in a movie, it's filled with explicit sexual content or violence. And we have to get rid of those foreign gods and pursue the God of Bethel. We notice next that the covenant is reconfirmed at Bethel. Jacob and his people with him came to Bethel in the land of Canaan. He built them altar there and he called it the place El Bethel which means the God of the house of God the God of the house of God 
The same place where he met God that first time that he left the land was fleeing from his brother Esau. And it's now at the same place and he builds an altar there. And we read that his faithful nurse, his mother's faithful nurse, died there and she died and they buried her under an oak tree they called the Oak of Weeping. Alon Bakuth, which means the Oak of Weeping. And as he builds an altar there and he calls this place the God of the house of God, God appears to him again. And he has been struggling to live up to his new name. And now God appears to him again in verse 10 and said to him, Your name is Jacob. You're living like Jacob. But you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. And so he named him Israel. Now at last Jacob was in the place that God wanted him to be. He was at Bethel. He had got rid of the foreign gods. And he was recognizing God once again. He did so before. Maybe that was the time that he walked the aisle. That was the time that he made his first profession of faith. And he had slid back into his old life. And now God calls him again and says, Your name is Israel. Live up to this name. And God reconfirms the covenant promises that he gave him 20 years earlier in the same place in Genesis 28. We said to him, I'll give you this land. And through your offspring, the nations of the earth will be blessed. And your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And I am the God of your father, Abram and Isaac. Your fathers, Abram and Isaac. Now we read how God repeats the promises in verses 11 to 13. God said to him, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will come from your body. Remember, this is just a clan. There's no idea of a state or a nation. And God speaks about kings coming from his body. That's why he, on his deathbed, pronounced the kingship that would come from one of his sons, namely Judah. Kings will come from you. The land God had promised to Abram and Isaac, God will also give to you. And then God blessed him. And then Jacob called that place Bethel. And he set up a stone pillar and then he moved up from Bethel. So my friends, here we have Jacob now meeting with God again. The second time in our story this morning. And then he moved on from Bethel, and as they were on their way to Ephra, which is later we would be called Bethlehem, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And then she died in childbirth, and she, as she was dying, she called the son Ben-Oni, which means son of my sorrow, son of my sorrow. And of course, Jacob changed the name of his son. To Benjamin, 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 son of my right hand. Why did he do that? Imagine he, the son was called Ben Oni, and wherever he went to school or with his friends, or and if anybody asked him, Why are you called son of my sorrow? And they tell him, It's because of you that your mother died. It's not a great name to have, eh? So, so Jacob decided this is not a name my son could live with for the rest of his life. I'd rather call him Benjamin, son of my right hand. And then we read another sad event in the lives of Jacob's sons. In verse 22, when Israel was living in that region, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine, Bila. This is actually the mother of two of the sons. Dan and Naphtali's mother. Now later on in the Old Testament, during the time of Moses, if you did this, what would happen to you? Death. Death penalty. That was one of the sins which God said cannot happen. 
the death penalty. Now why is this mentioned? This is like we read the story and we see these events and all of a sudden here we have, there's just this one line. Reuben. Who's Reuben? He's the firstborn. He's the one who would inherit the family name. He was, he was the one who would inherit the title. He was the one who would propagate the godly line. He's the one to whom all the blessings would go and the vast majority of the inheritance. And he throws it away. And that tells us that he will not receive that blessing. And we know that the next two boys in line, who were they? Simeon and Levi, they weren't inherited either because they killed all the Shechemites. And so the next boy in line was Judah. And Judah would be the one who would receive the family name. He would be the one who would rule over all his other brothers. He would be the one who would propagate the godly line. In God's providence, Judah would be the one. And that's why it's mentioned. And here at verse 23 to 26, we read all the names of these delightful sons of Jacob. The first, Reuben, the firstborn, Simeon and Levi. Reuben, the adulterer, what, I don't know what you call somebody who sleeps with his father's wife. I suppose you can't call a fornicator. Uh, Simeon and Levi, the killers, and then Judah, and Ishakar and Zebulun. And then the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Rachel's maidservant, Billa, Dan and Naphtali, and Leah's maidservant, Zilpah, Gad and Asher. And these were the sons of Jacob. And these boys, these men, they're not boys anymore, they're now grown men, they would become what? The leaders of the tribes of Israel. They would become the leaders, the patriarchs of all the tribes of the nation of Israel. So God can even use people like this. And that's why He can use people like you and me. Because He doesn't look at what we have done. He looks at what we can become and what Jesus has done for us. And even if we mess it up big time, God is still faithful to His covenant. And then we end off this morning by saying that Jacob eventually came home. He actually came back and he had this almost unnecessary sojourn of more than 20 years in, a, in his father's ancestral lands. We had to flee outside of Canaan. Remember, the blessing is connected to Canaan. He has to be in Canaan to receive the blessing. Now, after 20 years, after a long detour, he's back in the land. And he came home to his father Isaac in Mamre, near Kiriath Arba, or Hebron, where Abram and Isaac had stayed. And Isaac lived 180 years, and he breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. And here's some good news. His sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. So they didn't kill each other. Somewhere they lived together, apart, but they still buried their father together, which is good news. Because the first time Jacob ran away from his brother, and then when he met his brother the second time, he didn't trust him, and he moved on on his own, and now together they bury their father. And that's what so often happens at a funeral. Isn't that true? People who haven't spoken to each other for years, maybe brothers and sisters, maybe a child has been far from God, and when they stand at the graveside of their parent, they are shocked back into reality, and they reunite with people they've never spoken to before who I haven't spoken to for many, many years, and I've seen that happen. Where a funeral can unite people again, a family again. And then we read in Genesis 37, verse 1 and 2, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob, or this is the book of Jacob. So he ends off the story 
of the life of Jacob, which started back in Genesis 25, verse 19, and now we end at verse 2 of chapter 37, the book of Jacob. This is the life of Jacob. And included in that book is Genesis 36, which we will not look at because that is just like a lot of genealogies of Esau, the book of Esau we read in Genesis 36. And the next book that comes up is the book of the sons of Jacob. The book of the sons of Jacob. And that we will, Lord willing, look at not this year, but next year if the Lord spares us. So my friends, we come at the end of the life of Jacob and we saw how God took this man, was not a very likable man, a very deceptive person, a very selfish person, an ugly person. And God used this man because of his covenant promises and his covenant love which he had set upon this man, really not a pleasant person. And he used this man to fulfill the covenant promises to which would carry on to the next person which would be Judah and carry on the family line all the way to Christ despite all his failures despite all his sins and his weaknesses and so God can do that for us as well no matter what you have done in your past things that you've messed up sins you've done mistakes you've made God is the God of the covenant He's the God who is true to His promises. And that's a theme that runs right through the Bible. God is true to His covenant. That's why we have the Bible in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. We call it the Old Testament and the New Testament. God is true to His promises. And He can use, if He can use a person like Jacob, He can even use a person like me. Amen. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your word. And we see, Lord, that your word and your oath that you saw to ratify your covenant, that that stands above all our failures and weaknesses, all our sins, and all our turning away from you. And we see how this man, Jacob, you had to speak to him again and again, renaming on two occasions said to him, you are not Jacob, the one who grabs the heel. You are Israel, the upright one, the one who struggles with God and who overcomes. And yes, Lord, that's the story of every believer's life as well. So many times we slip back into the past, into things we have done wrong. We slip back into our old sins and old failures. And we grovel in the mud and we do these things Lord and yet you reach out to us and you bring us back and you wash us clean and you give us a new name and you tell us you are a son or a daughter of God and I am true to my covenant promises because of my son who has given his life to set you free and I want to see you in the kingdom with me. And we thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, we've been here from inception when uh, a number of us came over from the uh, uh, Dimbul, our Dimbul sister church. And we decided to start Beckenfeld Community Church. We stood together. We did a lot of fundraising. This was all done in the the city hall and uh, we did a lot of fundraising, got money together and the church grew and grew and grew and eventually we built this church. Yeah, so I've been here, we've been here from, from the word go, I don't know how many, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 21 years in total and uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a sad part for us to say goodbye but however, um, we see it as new beginnings for us. We're, we're going to take with us what we've learned here, um, the fellowship that we had here, we're going to take with us, we're going to take it there, and I think God has got a plan for us there. Um, and uh, because we weren't sure if He was going to, it was our plan always to go 
live closer to the sea and we wanted a dance club. My garden's getting too big to look after now. And, um, I, won't, I won't say I'm getting too old to look after it, but nevertheless, um, so we decided we, we're going to try new beginnings and closer to you know, the sea where I'd like to go and fish, take a fishing rod and, and catch a fish and take a walk on the beach and that sort of thing. And yeah, so God led us that's that avenue and so um, we are truly blessed for that and we just want to you know, thank you people, God, of course, uh, on, he's on, on, the, on the top of things, Johan, family, everything that we've learned here, that we've been the fellowship, we want to thank you. Amen. Okay, where are you going? <laughs> We're going to play. We came to claim by, which is about uh, 49 kilometers from Amanis. Can everybody hear? Can you right. hear? Okay. Um, I just want to thank everybody just here. Just want to thank everybody for the fellowship and the relationships that we've built up amongst this community. This is a very tough day for me, I'm sorry. You are all so special. You will always have a very special place in my heart. I pray for most of you every single day and I'll continue to do that. And I know Peter will thank you so much for the way you have treated us. It has been an absolute blessing and a joy and a pleasure to have been part of this community. Thank you. And Johan and Elsa for your leadership. You are such a special couple. You have guided us. You truly are the Lord Shepherd, Johan. Thank you so much for those awesome Bible studies. We have grown so much spiritually and we are forever and eternally grateful to you. I want to call the council up and we're going to lay hands on Kay and Peter and we're going to pray for them. Council has shrunk a little bit, but we're still there. <laughs> yeah. I think Trevor has also been here from the beginning, so I'm going to mm -hmm. ask Trevor to pray for them. Trevor, you, you can okay. pray for them. Look, just something that I read the other day as I thought of Peter and Kay. Um, it says some people come into our lives and they quickly go. Others stay a little bit longer and they leave footprints in our hearts and we are changed. And I think that is what I want to say. We are changed because of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's pray, let's commit them to the Lord. Father, the most difficult part of life is to say goodbye. And it's, it's hard. It's, it's something we feel we have lost. We're losing. We have lost something. And we're going to lose. But Lord, we also know that you have a special plan for each one of us. And although we cannot see it right now, um, the joy will follow in the morning. The joy will follow. The sun will follow after the storm. And so, Lord, we pray for Cain and Peter that as they depart, as they leave us, as they find new fellowship, as they settle into a new area with new friends and family and neighbors, that, Lord, you would use them as, 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 your, as your instruments in that part of the world to proclaim your message, to bring hope to others as they've done to us. Uh, Lord, and thank you that they have been a part of us. Thank you that you've given them to us for a time to be a blessing. Father, will you fill that void and that, uh, that, that uh, vacuum that is in our lives and also the vacuum in their lives? Will you fill it, Lord? We pray these things in your name. Amen. We've got a little gift. Um, I don't say you must buy, buy a, a, a garden dwarf or something, a garden no, but uh, maybe a plant or maybe you can take it out for, for lunch then claim by crayfish or something. Or you catch your own crayfish. Just a little uh, reminder from us and thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, friends, it's, it's sad every time one of the congregation goes away 
and uh, we lose, as Trevor said, we lose part of our identity and we pray that the Lord will be with Kay and Peter as they start up a new phase of their life there in Plain Bay and that Peter will catch a lot of fish <laughs> and uh, crayfish and, and, and uh, that they will just enjoy the time there and they find a good place of fellowship. We're going to sing again and uh, our last hymn is Christ is Surely Coming. So the music team can sing for us please.